everybody, welcome to their how to play video. Today we're taking a look at Battletech Essentials. This is the new introductory box that is on pre-order right now and should soon be available for those of you watching in the future from Target. Um, it's a Target exclusive from Catalyst Game Labs and is an introductory box to Battletech. Now you can check out my review of the box set here uh, by clicking in the cards, uh, but today we're gonna focus on learning the core fundamentals of Battletech. Um, and uh, using what comes in this box to play a game. Now, this is not the full uh, Game of Armored Combat rules for Battletech. There are no heat tracking and critical hit locations in here, but this gives you enough to understand the general principles of moving around, firing your weapons, and tracking damage on the exterior of your battle mech until either the head or body is destroyed and one side is victorious. The game is set in a um, sort of like game planet called Solaris 7. Imagine if American Gladiators uh, took place with, you know, 50 foot tall giant robots um, and you get the gist of what it's going for. Now I've painted up the two models in the box, um, which is a rifleman and a centurion to represent the two pilots and pilot cards that you also get in here. And we're gonna have a throwdown in the Badlands between two robots as I explain the core fundamentals of the rules. So let's take a look at the models, what comes in the box and get this underway. So here we have the Battletech Essentials box set all pieced out uh, and ready to play. I've also painted up and display next to them the standees for the two models that come in the box. Now they come pre-assembled, um, so you do not have to paint them if you don't want to, but I thought it'd be fun too. And as I like painting models, I match the color schemes on these two miniatures. Um, so over here we have the um, Rifleman 3N and the Centurion uh, C9A, I think it is, class of Battle Mech. Um, and they are piloted by uh, Justin Shang Allard uh, for the Centurion and Gray Norton for the Rifleman, who are two rival pilots thrown down. Um, you have the match sheet. And for the first mission out of the Battletech Essentials rulebook, uh, this is the, um, the match sheet we we're uh, shown like to actually play on. Extra standees here for a Wolverine uh, Thunderbolt, um, who are also characters and have character cards of their own. Anya Terrell for the Wolverine and Chuck Mabuto um, for the Thunderbolt. Uh, we have our wall raised and lowered tokens for the other side of this map sheet and some additional terrain pieces. I threw a couple on here just for fun. Uh, extra light terrain if I want to use it and light terrain over here uh, just to show how you can enhance and change the maps. So everything laid out, my map sheet is down uh, as per the introductory scenario in here. I got my dice to one side. Um, I have some like additional things I put down here to play just to kind of like ease the game. I have a turn tracker. Uh, it's just a big 3D printed FDM dice that I used to track the turn. I have my dice roller. This was made by a uh, wonderful um, friend of mine named Jason. Uh, it's just some quarter round uh, with a like printout of my logo, uh, but it'll help me when I roll the dice to come in the box set to not have them fly over the place and stay on camera. Um, and then I've used some of these. These are uh, four by six uh, card sleeves, and I've just cut along one side to put them on the record sheets for the two battle mechs we're using. So I can use a dry erase marker, one final additional thing, uh, to mark all the damage, and then just reuse the cards if I want. Finally, I have some additional small colored dice here, um, and I'm going to use these to track movement points, whether or not someone is running, sprinting, or jumping, uh, which are the three various kinds of movement. So with everything laid out in front of me, uh, I don't need any of this stuff right now, so this is all additional material I won't be using, um, except for the rules on this sheet I will probably use which are just the uh, where the pilots come from. They get some bonus rules to make their battle mix a little bit different. The rule book, all right, the quick start rules. So, uh, quick start sequence of play. First, there's the initiative phase. So, um, when you set up a scenario, the first thing you're gonna do is roll to see who goes first. Both players roll two dice, and the high roller will have the initiative for the turn. Now, you'd think that would let you move first, but actually in Battletech, seeing where your opponent has moved to, is the advantage, so you actually um, move and shoot second when you win the initiative roll in order to take advantage of the opponent having to act before you and also seeing what they do with their damage when they fire their weapons. Roll out of the way, we have the movement phase, in which case you will use your movement points. So um, each of these guys you can see here on the dish sheet have movement points, walking four, running six, um, and movement points are spent to move around the table on the map sheet. Now the map sheet has um, hexes, which denote you're facing. So this is your front hex here, wherever your cockpit is kind of facing. Um, and it is a single movement point to move forward a hex. It's also a movement point to pivot a hex. It is two movement points to move backwards as it's harder to pilot going backwards um, when you're moving your battle mech. So those are the general movement uh, rules and principles. So if you're walking, for instance, and you're a rifleman, you have four movement points, you could move forward one, pivot for two, and then move forward again for three, four, and be done moving at a move, at which point you would check to see what your um, target movement modifier is. 
Uh, and we'll talk about that in a second, but generally speaking, the further, the more hexes you move, the harder you are to shoot at because the faster you're moving. So even if you spend all your movement points and you're like kind of dirtling around, you're not very hard to move because you're in the same kind of general location. But if you actually did like locate or relocate your battle mech by like four movement points, you're gonna be harder to hit. The general like speaking rule is, if you move at least three, you have a plus one to hit. If you move at least five, you have a plus two to hit. You have to move seven. It's all the odd numbers. So three, five, and seven. Um, that's how many hexes you need to move in order to get the three different modifiers. So plus one, plus two, plus three. Before you move also makes it harder for you to attack. So you have to consider that during that same movement phase. Um, and you will then put down the appropriately colored dice. Uh, because if you walked, so if you moved at all, you're going to get a white dice, which means it's uh, one point more difficult for you to shoot. If you ran, you're going to get a black dice, which means it's two points more difficult to shoot. And if you jumped, you use your jump jets, which neither of these guys have, so it's not a huge deal. You put a red dice down, it would be plus three to your rolling to hit. Things to look out for when you're moving is on the maps, you'll see light. Uh, the hard pack gravel, we're not going to use the rules for that this turn, but there's a chance you like skid out on it. Uh, on this map, but the important thing is light and heavy terrain. So heavy terrain gives a plus two modifier to hit, light terrain gives a plus one modifier to hit when you're rolling to hit, which we'll explain later. But just like moving, being in terrain can be a way to make your opponent miss you. Uh, it also provides difficulty in moving. So when you want to move into a point with uh, light terrain on it, it costs you an additional movement point to move into. So if we want to move forward normally, it's two to move into something with light terrain. Turning doesn't change at all. You can turn still for free and you can move out of it for free, but going inside of it is more difficult is appropriately more difficult so it's two extra points to move into so it would cost instead of one to move into this it would cost three but likewise it also gives you a better benefit to being hit come up because neither of these guys have jump jets but if you jump into something there's no additional penalty you just put the mech up and then place it inside your jumping range jumping is an incredibly versatile way to move around um but it also in more advanced games will like cause you to heat up and it makes it harder for you to shoot because you're in the air Movement. Then there's the weapon attack phase. And once again, we starting with the person that lost the initiative so you can see what happens before you get to react. Um, you will roll with all of your weapons. Now everyone is covered in guns. You can see here in various parts of their body, as those parts of the body get shot off, you can lose those guns. So like for instance, this guy's got a large laser. It's on his left arm. So if that left arm ever gets destroyed, he loses that gun as well. Same with his uh, auto cannon five, his AC five. It's also on his left arm. It would go away if it got blown off. You can fire with all your guns. Um, in this demo version of the game, that's there's no penalty to doing that because you don't acquire any heat, but in more advanced versions later on, um, which we won't concern ourselves with here, firing all your guns might be bad because it starts to heat you up like crazy. So if you're firing a bajillion lasers, for instance, your, your little nuclear reactor inside of you, your fusion reactor, is having to put out a lot of power. And that's gonna generate a lot of heat and uh, it can cause your mech to just like completely shut down as it's just ripping hot doing stuff. So you can just shoot with all your guns. Now they all have different um, various ranges and the modifier to hit the further you get away um, is plus zero, plus two, and plus four. So like a large laser, for instance, is more accurate at longer range than for instance, a medium laser, which is much shorter range. Um, so, and that's all counted in hexes and it's the closest hex. So it's from the front hex of your battle mech to the hex that the person's actually in. So I'm counting hexes from this rifleman right now to the centurion. I would count one, two, three, four, five, six, the shortest distance to get to him. See if you can see somebody before you wire fire your weapons and seeing there can be intervening stuff in the way, like for instance, terrain, like the light and heavy stuff. Um, every piece of terrain adds a sort of like point of um, terrain in the way. Uh, and if you have more than three points in the way, so from the middle of your base to the middle of their base, then it's considered obscured and you can't see anymore. He's in a heavy piece of woods. He's got two pieces of terrain um, that I could, uh, sorry, he's behind it actually, because if you're in it, they can see into you. Um, if he was between it, he'd have two points of terrain from the center of the base to the center of the base. So it doesn't block line of fire, but I'd have to take that penalty to hit. However, if I moved this to here, there'd be a light for one point and a heavy for three points, and I would no longer have line of fire. In, in the way there. So you can use train to your advantage to be able to like get a turn where you can't be shot um, or generally like escape line of fire. You have to be in line of sight and your forward arc is the hexes basically diagonally out from your front. So you have directly ahead of you and then you have all the hexes you can see to here. Now and again in advanced games you can do what's called torso twisting. I usually denote it by putting a dice down. So your front facing uh, doesn't change, say the same but you, you pivot your waist so you can shoot stuff and you can twist your torso to the left or right and it changes your arc appropriately. But in this game we're just gonna worry with the, the basic forward facing. Pick your target and in this game it's just gonna be two battle mechs so we have to too worry about you know there being too much on the board here. Uh, we're gonna roll to hit um, and you roll to hit by calculating gator. So first it's your gunnery skill um, and for both these guys their gunnery skill is going to be set 
that. So this card here, you can see his gunnery skill is one and his piloting skill is two. Newton has a gunnery skill of one and a piloting skill of one. So they're very skilled pilots because you have to roll a one or higher on two dice added together. That's pretty easy. So gunnery skill is the first step of Gator. So yeah, one or higher, that's, uh, that's an automatic hit. But there's other modifiers. So first, the target movement modifier. Uh, sorry, first is the uh, attacker movement modifier. Um, so did you move or not? So let's say this guy moved and he moved three hexes. So he has a one uh, and he is walking. So the white dice goes next to him. So that means his piloting skill of one goes to two because he's plus one to hit from having moved a walk. Then you go to the T Gator, which is the target movement modifier. So walk three, the Centurion is going to have a target movement modifier of one. It was pilot skill plus the, your um, your attacker modifier plus your target modifier is three. So now I need to roll a three or better, which means I could miss. You have terrain modifiers, so it's going to be what kind of um, terrain is he behind? In this case, heavy woods are intervening, so that's another plus two. So that three is going to go to a five, and I have to roll a five to hit. There's range, so how far away am I? And that's going to change every single time I fire a gun, because my guns have various ranges. So for instance, my AC5, we already counted that I'm one, two, three, four, five, six, seven away. Uh, my AC5, actually I was six away before, wasn't I? I'm going to there. My AC5 was, um, I actually wouldn't be able to see, was uh, outside of six, so it would be in, or sorry, my large laser is outside of five, so it would be in medium range, so I'd be plus, I'd be hitting on sevens, whereas the AC5 has a six range, which means I'd be hitting at plus zero, which is a five. So different guns are gonna have different range modifiers. That's why it's good to calculate the Gato part <laughs> first and then worry about the final range modifier afterwards because that's the part's gonna change with different weapons. Hit. So I'm gonna roll the hit with, let's say, I'll start off with that large laser. So it is in medium range, so it needs a seven to hit. So I roll the two dice, add them together, and Gray lands a hit. So then we have to see where it lands on the armor. Currently the armor diagram here has my 2d6 roll. So two to seven is the center torso, right? Three, four is the right arm, uh, five is the right leg, six is the right torso, seven is going to be the center torso, uh, eight is gonna be the left torso, nine is the left leg, 10, 11 is the left arm, and um, 12 is the head. So let's see where we land. So four, so the four result is the right arm, or the right, yeah, the right arm. Uh, so I get my dry erase marker, and how much damage, well, it's this guy's arm. How much damage is a large laser? It's eight damage points, so I mark off eight damage points. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And that's now filled in. on the list, firing all my weapons uh, until I have either missed with all of them, hit with all of them, uh, and I've completed my attacks. And then my opponent would start doing the same thing back. Now, any damage I've done isn't counted until the end of the turn. So anything I blow off or extra damage I do, weapons I disable or destroy, it won't be applied until the turn ends. There are some weapons like missile launchers, uh, like an LRM here that he has, that will uh, require a cluster table, uh, which is how many hits, how many missiles actually hit after you hit. Um, and what you do is you take the number of missiles. So for a long range missile launcher with 10 missiles, you do one point of damage per missile, and you'd roll to see how many of them actually land. So with 10 missiles on a roll of seven, you would get six missiles landing. And you group that damage. You try and break it into groups of five. So it'd be a five point damage to the eight. So on this guy, eight is gonna be the left torso. You take five points of damage. And that last one point would go to the 12, which is the head. So you, go, you can see it splashes this whole general area. The fact that it's not one projectile, it's like a cloud of missiles going across and landing on him. If there's too much damage on a location, the remaining damage follows the arrows and gets transferred in further, basically. So you never lose damage if something gets blown off. It'll go towards the center of the battle mech. Introductory box, a mech is destroyed when its head or center torso is destroyed. So the center torso obviously is its engine, the head is the pilot. Either one of those things will just kill you. And so for the purpose of how to play, we're not gonna use all of the advanced piloting rules. We're gonna save that for the let's play afterwards. Um, but we will run through the first scenario, the training scenario, which uses this map sheet. You can see we've already laid out. Um, we roll off, the defender is going to be the, um, the House Davian battle mech, which is over here, which is Justin Allard. And he gets deployed first off within two hexes of the uh, first, or sorry, the south edge actually, which is over here. Uh, and then the rival battle mech, which is Gray Norton, will deploy opposite. The victory condition for this one is the first one to destroy the enemy battle mech. So we'll run through the, the first um, game basically to show the core concepts and you can be back with the next episode where we start introducing things like the pilot special abilities um, and of course the Solaris 7 stables rules too. 
uh, to give us a little bit more variation. One initiative, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the uh, turn dice next to the battle mech that has initiative when we win. Uh, so rolling for the Centurion, he'll get a six, and the Rifleman has got a five. So that means that Justin takes the lead. And the Rifleman needs to move first. So uh, with Gray having lost the initiative, uh, the discretion is a better part of Valor. He's going to run. Uh, he's going to go one movement hex forward. A run is uh, six hexes for him. And then he's going to go two, three, four, five. And then pivot one more time for six. Started here, that means he's moved one, two, three, four hexes, giving him a movement modifier of one and a run dice because he ran. Justin, deciding that he could take the lead, will just move one, two, three, four hexes forward and happy to stay out of the effective range of those Rifleman's weapons. He has moved four, which gives him also a target movement modifier of one, but he's only walked instead of ran. It's into the combat phase. So because he lost the initiative, uh, Gray has to go first and he will fire. He's gonna fire all of his weapons in order and we're gonna do the Gator modifiers again. So he has a gunnery skill of one. He ran, so two, three, because that's his attacker modifier. Four, because he has a move modifier of one on his target for the T. Now the range will do the rest, and he is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight away. So we look at his weapon sheet. That means everything except for the medium lasers is going to be in medium range. Four plus two is six. That means he needs a six or better to hit with all of these guns. So we'll do the large lasers first. There are two of them doing eight points of damage. So the first one hits with a six. And where does it land? It lands in the four. So that'll be eight damage to the right arm. So one, two, three, four. It was eight. The second one on a six, it also hits. And where does it land? In the six this time around. That's the right torso. So three, five, eight damage. So that's both the large lasers. The AC5s will also hit on sixes for five damage each. First one misses and the second one Hey, it's with a nine. I was gonna roll in the dice roll and then immediately forgot to do it. <laughs> so it lands with a nine and where does it hit him for five points of damage? In the 10, which is this arm. So two, four, five damage. The medium lasers, uh, they are a plus four at that range. So it's an additional two points of modifier. They're gonna hit on eights. You might as well give it a try. So the first one misses and the second one hits. Now where does it land? It's only going to be five points of damage. Lands in the five which is the leg. So two, four, five damage. It plinked away a little bit of damage onto Justin, but didn't actually seal the deal. And so now he gets to fire back as his half of the combat phase. Versus AC 10, he knows that he is uh, the same distance away. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that's gonna put um, everything into medium range, except for the two medium lasers that are in long range. Should be tracking data for the shots on the AC fives, but I don't think they're going to take um, uh, 20 shots over the course of this game. They might, they've taken, he's taken two so far, so he has 18 remaining. A handy way to do it, grab a d20 and just spin it down, as opposed to marking it with pencils. All right, so uh, without having run, calculating gator for this guy, he is gunnery skill one, uh, he is two for having walked, and then three, four for range, um, and five for that TMM. So one easier because he walked instead of running, and he's gonna fire the AC-10 first for 10 damage. Where does it go? It hits, and it hits Gray in the 11, which is the left arm, for 10 damage. So two, four, six, eight, 10. It's a huge amount of damage to the arm. That LRM-10 also in medium range, so also needing a five. It misses. And then it's two worse for the medium lasers because they are um, in long range. And that means that they will hit on two better. So sevens instead of fives. So the first one hits, it lands in the five, which is the leg for five damage. The second one hits in the, or actually it misses and doesn't hit at all. It's mad dash, great, did more damage than anyone else. We reset to turn two and we're back to rolling initiative. Destroyed, so once again, rolling for Justin. He gets a 10. And Gray gets an eight. So Justin's still having the initiative on turn two. Since Gray does need to move first. So he is going to move uh, into light terrain, I think, and go one, two, and pivot for three. Uh, sorry, it was one, two, three, and then pivot for four. Now he does not have any um, TMM because he only moved two hexes, like fully, but he does have the light cover, which will, some people like to put the cover modifier right on the dice. 
Uh, I actually really prefer that, so I'm gonna add that in. Didn't have a movement modifier, you still use the white dice and you put a six, which counts as a zero. Do it that way, because that's traditional. Uh, so now it is um, Justin's turn to move. And moving one, two, three, four, five, six. It's to sprint instead, and that gives him a danger close. Uh, he has also moved five hexes. Um, he pivoted one, two, three, four, five. So no, actually only moved four hexes. So that's gonna give him a team of one and a sprint. More importantly, it took him out of Gray's front arc. And because we're not using the torso twist rules here um, in this uh, demo game, this means that he cannot be shot right now. We're having to shoot first, he has no targets because all of his guns uh, cannot shoot uh, outside of arc. Advanced game, he'd be able to twist his torso to look at him. Um, you could also even flip your guns to shoot backwards as long as your arm guns, but your torso guns would have to shoot in different directions. So where your guns are mounted in uh, the more advanced, like complete rules uh, can matter a whole bunch. But in this case, because we're just using some core concepts, uh, Justin's gotten out of the way now and he's free to just fire as um, Gray just skips his turn. Start with the AC-10. It's gonna fire uh, on a one and then he is in cover for two. Three, four, because he ran. And that's gonna be it. Inside that short range. 10 damage. Oh, and he lands it. Where does it land? Oh no, the head! And that's it! With boxcars, 10 damage to the head. One, two, three, four, five, six. He just decapitates just or uh, Gray. Um, and the rifleman falls to the ground, exploded. That's it. That will complete our how to play. Um, having uh, probably been able to weather some more fire too without having been destroyed unless that lucky headshot came through. That is a, a instant sort of pilot death. Um, and actually 10 points of damage to the head would kill. I think even the advanced game would probably kill him. I don't think the pilot has that much health uh, in its critical systems. So there you go. A uh, quick look at how to play Battletech. And of course this scenario concluded with one of the two pilots being destroyed. And in this case, uh, Gray, Norton, Gray Norton is taken down uh, by Justin Allard in his uh, rifleman. As uh, yeah, that AC-10 just blew his, blew his cockpit apart and took the head out. Beyond the quick start game, if you've got your copy of Battletech Essentials or you pre it in the future and it's your first intro to Battletech. Um, some useful things would be, of course, the Game of Armored Combat box. What I like about that box is it comes with two complete lances of battle mechs. Copy right here, and I've already painted up all my battle mechs, but you're going to get all unique mechs to what you have already. A, um, and, and actually, you're going to get models for the two mechs that are standees in here, too, if you want to paint them up for using the Slayer 7 rules. Uh, so you're going to get a rule book for Game of Armored Combat uh, with some more advanced combat stuff in here and even rules for designing your own battle mechs. You get another novella, uh, you get alpha strike cards, and you get a catapult, a thunderbolt, a wolverine, a locust, a shadowhawk, a commando, a battle master, and an awesome. You get all the same cool stuff as well as... Um, the more advanced Battletech-like marker sheets too, which include all the internal principles, and this will allow you to play the full core combat game. Two more maps, dice, and everything else. So this is probably the best next step um, after the Essentials box if you've just discovered Battletech through this. From there, you can play for a long time. That's a lot of battle mechs. Having 10 battle mechs, uh, especially when you're playing Battletech Classic, is a is a, a lot of mechs. That's a, that's a lot of like different maps to play on. You're gonna get more 2D terrain as well, punch out terrain. Uh, um, and you can you can play a long time uh, just using what what comes in those two boxes. If you want to grab the technical readouts, you get the uh, more advanced weapon sheets for these guys as well. You have the ability to play for a good long time. Uh, if you decide you want to play larger games, on top of that, there's then the free uh, Alpha Strike Quick Start rules, and you're gonna have the Alpha Strike cards in this box for playing the mass combat version of the game, which allows you to play with like whole companies. Not that you can't play with whole companies in classic BattleTech. Uh, it just would take you like an entire weekend. So <laughs> it's nice to be able to play. Uh, sort of like more than one large mass combat game at a time and Alpha Strike provides that. So there we go. A look at Battlestick Essentials, this uh, this new sort of like um, arena combat style game. There are additional missions to play through um, and of course the story of like these sort of like a gladiator style reality TV stars and their battle mechs uh, to explore and expand upon as well with Slayer 7. And we'll get to that in the Let's Play. So you go how to play Battletech using the Essentials box um, and the Battle Mechs provided and walking through the core concepts of the game. Now, of course, the next episode of this is a Let's Play where we're going to play in the Slayer 7 Arena uh, and have sort of like a show, like a, it's like a, a full-on, uh, what was the game, most extreme elimination challenge uh, where there's going to be moving walls and people blowing each other up. I'm shocked from the picture of like the Slayer 7 Stadium that like 
the entire crowd isn't just killed by like rogue missiles and auto cannon shots. Like there needs to be something going on there where they don't all just die. Um, but that'd be a fun one to do a separate video because it's the next mission. It's the other side of the map sheet and you can see some of the fun wacky rules for the pilots themselves and of course the stables that they come from uh, as they do like a full on like, like uh, aggression era uh, WWF sort of like mech showdown. So thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed that how to play video and if you have grabbed Battletech through the essentials box if that was useful for you. Till next time Ash. Hey there, I hope you enjoyed that video. There are tons of other games already recorded for you to watch. Click over to my channel page if you haven't already and have a look through the dozens of playlists full of videos. I guarantee you'll discover a game you haven't seen played before. I put out new videos seven days a week and every day is themed to a different genre as I continue to explore the wider world of gaming. Of course, none of that's possible without you, the viewer, so click a like and subscribe if you'd like to stay on top of what's happening here daily. My two kids and I are massively grateful to be able to have the flexibility of this job so I can always maximize my time with them. If you want to support me continuing to put out this content, it's only possible because of my amazing backers on Patreon who support the studio, equipment, and model cost, as well as being how I make the bulk of my living. You can also help out by buying a t-shirt through Spreadshirt, a measuring gauge or widget from Death Ray Designs, or buying one of my games and supplements like Last Days, Game of Wolves, and Blaster. As a way of showing my appreciation, patrons get early access to new games and supplements that I write throughout the course of the year. Huge thanks for watching, it really does help out, and happy gaming.